This unit houses the central theme of all of geology, and that is plate tectonics. So with that, it's pretty important. Let's get started. Uh, from the last unit, recall the outermost portion of the Earth is the lithosphere. So based on those physical properties, it is the lithosphere. Okay, this is composed of brittle rock that's basically broken up into a series of plates. Okay, and basically plate tectonics studies the movements, causes, effects, interactions of all these different types of plates. That is incorporated, like I said, into plate tectonics. So why is it important? So many reasons, but I had to list some. Uh, volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, landslides, basically anything that make our Earth a dynamic planet are going to go into effect to uh, relate to plate tectonics. And if scientists wanted to predict these events, Okay, like in the last unit, I talked about predictions of earthquakes. We need to understand these plate boundaries and actually get a feel for what they're doing. So with that being said, let's get started with the evolution of this theory. And it starts with a guy named Alfred Wegener. And in 1915, he proposed a theory uh, based on something called continental drift, basically saying that in the beginning, okay, not the very, very beginning, but uh, it was all one giant landmass called Pangaea, and it moved apart over time. And, and basically, uh, he said that these continents moved apart because of forces that he didn't really go get into that much. Uh, but basically, it started out as Pangaea, they moved apart, and that's why our continents are all spread out. And other scientists suggested this before him. I don't want you to get the misconception that he was the first one to come up with continental drift, but he was the first one to come up with evidence to support continental drift. And one of these pieces of evidence is the fact that these continents fit together like pieces in a jigsaw puzzle. Okay, so notice that each of the continents, if you take any map on your globe, they, they are really, really specific. And if you put them together, they almost look like they would form a piece. But this only happens at about 2,000 meters. Uh, I believe at low depths is when they, they fit almost perfectly. Okay, another source of evidence uh, is that these rocks and mountain chains actually kind of go hand in hand, and it makes sense that these rocks and mountain changes were continuous. They were continuous in Pangaea. So let's say like the Appalachian Mountains start in uh, the eastern United States, they go into Newfoundland, uh, and they kind of extend into Europe. Pangaea style. And as they split apart, scientists have noticed, noticed that these Appalachian Mountains have kind of almost been interconnected uh, with corresponding parts of North America and Europe. And it makes sense they were once joined together and they formed one mountain chain. So they continued along different continents. Another source of evidence that I don't necessarily agree with the most, uh, but they've noticed that glaciers do kind of the same thing. So we can actually kind of measure uh, in, in bedrock where glaciers have been and, and they leave a distinguishable distinct distinguishing mark Okay on different different parts of the earth. So we've been able to trace that back. The reason I don't like it is uh, Basically glaciers are like oh well South America if South America were once at the South Pole and this happened, but what I do know What I do know is glaciers accumulate in an area and they spread outward Okay, so it kind of makes sense that, that if glaciers were on all these different continents, they started from one area that they accumulated from, and they spread out. And that's why you have glacier markings all over. Okay, and also probably the more important one, fossils of plants and animals that have corresponded, okay? There's a freshwater reptile called the Mesosaurus. Again, I believe it was a lizard or a dinosaur type. Um, and it was freshwater. So it makes no sense to find uh, corresponding fossils of this mesosaurus in South America and Africa, considering the ocean is not freshwater, it is salt water. Okay, so how did it come to be? How did we find these different fossils? Well, Pangaea. Pangaea basically um, housed these different fossils in, in an area along here, and they spread apart over time. And also plants, I believe the uh, Glycepterus leaves is just another example of fossils that, that were on different continents. Okay, in Wegener's time, here's the main idea. The idea of continental drift did not blindly get accepted because of the lack of a mechanism. He didn't really go into the why these continents split apart, but he did have evidence, which is why he was not completely shunned by the scientific community. Before we get too much into plates, I need to talk about some anatomy of what the ocean floor looks like. So there are three parts. There are three parts of the ocean floor, continental margins, deep ocean basins, and the mid-ocean ridge. And I believe I had you memorize uh, some of this at one point, but I want to go a little more into detail. Okay, so we're going to start out with continental margins. Continental margins themselves are composed of three parts, a shelf, slope, and a rise. So here's the deal. Uh, 
basically kind of like a person standing on here. You still feel the continent on you, and as you extend from the coastline, uh, you're walking, you're walking, and there's like a, a, a degree. There's an acclimation of like one degree or less. Okay, it's not very much. And then something called a shelf break occurs, and it's right here, marks the end of the continental shelf and the beginning of the slope, and the slope is just this gradient, this steep gradient that goes all the way over here. Okay, it extends a few degrees, and eventually it kind of curves itself out into the continental rise. So this area right here would be the rise. That's all there is to that. Um, but I do want to note that there are two types of continental margins, passive and active. Passive continental margins have all three of these parts and are generally seismologically inactive. Not a lot of earthquakes or volcanoes or tsunamis really happen here because these, uh, like this would be a passive one, they happen within one plate. And te plate tectonics deals with the interaction of two plates. Okay, so if this is intraplate movement, um, you're not going to see a lot of seismic activity, uh, but you're going to see a shelf, a slope, and a rise. Active continental margins usually only have a shelf and a slope, and the reason is right here would be an active continental margin, because you have a shelf, you have a slope, and plate tectonics, these two plates interacting, something called a convergent boundary, which I'll get into probably the next episode, but basically it forms this area called a trench, where it's one of the deepest portions of the ocean, it goes all the way over here, and it doesn't have time to curve itself out into a rise. So normally active continental margins do not have a rise, they just kind of spring up into the deep ocean basin. Okay, uh, so it has a shelf and a slope that descends into a trench. A trench is a very, very deep part of the ocean. In fact, the deepest portion of the entire ocean is called, the, is called Challenger's Deep. I believe two people uh, have made it to Challenger's Deep. One of them is a famous film star, I'm sorry, film director Cameron, oh, I forgot his name. I'll, I'll think of it later. But a trench, basically the Mariana Trench is the deepest portion of the Pacific Ocean. So let's get going with deep ocean basins. So Active continental margins are right here, and then you have a relatively flat portion of the ocean called a deep ocean basin. Okay, and these, these completely flat portions are called abyssal plains. He directed the Terminator. Who, who was that? I'll figure it out. All right, abyssal plains are completely flat, and the reason they're flat is because all of these sediments uh, that find themselves kind of crossing, okay, they're going to come down onto the ocean floor, and they're going to pack layer upon layer upon layer, uh, and that's going to make for a smooth area. Okay, but it's not without uh, rough portions. Pockets of this oceanic crust get penetrated, and the result is an interaction with the seething hot mantle, which produces things called hydrothermal vents. Hydro meaning water, and thermal meaning heat. Okay, uh, so basically when the water seeps in over here, it comes out of steam. The example I like to think of is when you're cooking and you have a, a plate or something really, really hot on the stove for a really long time and you spit into it. I don't know why you would spit into it, but if you pour water on it, it just, just has a lot of steam because that hot area uh, gets a little water and that causes causes steam. So I want to take a brief moment to talk about hydrothermal vents, and I think they're awesome because of two reasons. Biologically, you see organisms that actually live in hydrothermal vents, like bacteria and uh, other organisms like diatoms, and, and I think it's fascinating because hydrothermal vents are really, really impossible to live in, and they're in aphotic zones of the ocean, meaning aphotic, um, aphotic means without light, like a photon without light, um, and they still live there, and they actually thrive in, in this hot environment. Also, they have a lot of mineral deposits because the mantle is rich with things that we can't really easily get. Uh, so what's going to happen eventually is that steam is going to come up or, or water is going to come up, and we're going to be able to take minerals off of some of those hydrothermal vents. So that's pretty important. Okay, along with hydrothermal vents, we're still talking about deep ocean basins. We have the mid-ocean ridge, and I like to think of the mid-ocean ridge as like the seam of a baseball. Okay, so the seam of a baseball kind of goes and wraps around the entire the entirety of the baseball, or think of it like a belt. Basically, you're going to have this continuous underwater mountain chain that runs through the whole ocean. Now, sections of the mid-ocean ridge can be classified as either ridges or rises, and you don't really know that you don't need to know the difference between those. But if you see things like uh, the mid the mid Atlantic ridge is a famous one, and also the East Pacific Rise. Uh, 
those are examples of sections uh, of the mid-ocean ridge. So if you see the word ridge or rise, they're going to be associated with the mid-ocean ridge. And we're going to talk about how that's actually formed, but I wanted to introduce that to you as part of the anatomy. Finally, we're going to have some underwater volcanoes, and I'm not going to get too much in depth with that, but seamounts, seamounts are underwater volcanoes that rise above the seafloor. So this is the seafloor, this is the surface of the ocean, and I believe they extend about a kilometer above, okay? And, and they're generally kind of pointed, they don't necessarily have to be, but if they rise above sea level, rise above sea level, what, what's going to happen is these waves are going to crash into it and essentially flatten the tops. So if this happens, if erosion smooths the surface of these volcanoes above sea, mount, sea level, it's called a table mount because it looks like a table due to the flat nature, or a gyo. Okay, so one more time, let's talk you through this diagram. So the continental margin is going to generally be this area. So that's going to be your continental margin. And it's composed of a shelf that extends like less than a degree, and then a shelf break leading into a sharp slope, and then a rise. If it doesn't have all three of these portions, it's probably going to be an active continental margin because of the, the presence of a trench. Then you have the mid-ocean, uh, the sorry, the deep ocean basin that extends, and you have flat portions called abyssal plains. You have sea mounts. If they rise above sea level like this, it's going to be a table mount. And then you have the mid-ocean ridge, which is kind of like an underwater volcano system. Individual uh, volcanoes are going to be sea mounts or table mounts or gyos, uh, but but this, this continuous chain is called a mid-ocean ridge. We're going to talk about that more in the next video, but I thought I'd introduce you to that.